So do turn again in your Bibles uh, please, to Mark 15 and these, um, these few words, but these incredibly important words about the death of Jesus. We are coming almost to the end. If we're on a journey to King's Cross, if we're on a train, you've come into a station, the train is coming towards the buffers, it's going to slow down. It's not quite, we've not quite got to the end exactly. But we can see the platform and the station, and uh, it, it, it's all beginning perhaps to make sense now, the journey we are on, as we come to the death of Jesus. It's hope it makes sense. I hope it will today. These events are awesome, not in the way that people today talk about things being awesome. It's a very cheap word today, isn't it? But there is real awesomeness in these words. Let me just read to you the first three verses of the whole Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The world began in darkness. Creation that was formed out of darkness. The Lord said, let there be light. And suddenly light appeared, but there wasn't light initially. It was dark. Move on. Several thousand years, however many uh, there may have been. To the land of Egypt. The land of slavery. The plagues are being pronounced by Moses. The ninth plague, the one before the angel of death came. The penultimate plague, as you know, was the plague of darkness, total darkness for three days over the land of Egypt. People, it says uh, in uh, Exodus uh, chapter 10, people could not leave their homes because they wouldn't be able to know where to go out in the street. They wouldn't know, they could perhaps feel the walls and the doors in their homes, but that was all they were confident of. They would not go out of their homes. And it says it was darkness that could be felt. Imagine that, can you imagine that darkness that can be felt? No, I've had a really scary verse, darkness that can be felt. Something really clinging to you about that darkness that can be felt in Egypt. Although the people of Israel, it says at the same time, lived in light in Goshen. But the land of Egypt was in darkness. The Old Testament prophesied a great day of the Lord that would come, a judgment day, and darkness would be the sign, just as it was before creation, just as it was over Egypt in that ninth plague. We looked at Amos, remember Amos last year, and we read these words at one point, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? I asked you earlier, why do you prefer light? When light can blind you. So Amos says, why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be pitch dark without a ray of brightness. Then he says this a little bit later. In that day, the day of the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darkness, and darken the earth in broad daylight. Do you hear that? Amos' prophecy, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the, the earth in broad daylight. Mark is very precise, isn't he? He's been giving the timings all through. At the third hour, at the sixth hour, at the ninth hour, this whole process of Jesus' death is catalogued it's, it's put in a chronology. Verse 33, at the sixth hour. The sixth hour, you know, they count it from six in the morning. The sixth hour is noon. At noon, there is darkness over the land. Can you see that this is a fulfillment of Amos' prophecy? That the day of the Lord, in some form, has arrived here. 
If Amos' prophecy is correct, I mean, how could Mark not realise that, or how could anyone not realise that actually Amos has prophesied that darkness will come at noon in broad daylight, and here it is, at noon, the sixth hour exactly, and darkness came over the whole land. Darkness is a sign, isn't it, of the day of the Lord. And that day, the arrival of that day, is confirmed by this cry of dereliction, of abandonment from Jesus. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. The Son of God, who has been from all eternity, has never in that, say, whole time, but from eternity, has never known separation from the Father. Until now. This is such a unique cry because he is entering unknown territory for him. He has never been separated from the Father. Now he is experiencing darkness. Not just the darkness of that day, but the darkness of separation from his Father, who is light. The wrath of the Father is on him. The darkness, the blackness, the separation, because he is carrying the sin of the world. We read in Habakkuk in the Old Testament that the God's eyes, the Lord's eyes, are too pure to look on evil. He cannot look. We, read, we sang that last hymn. Your, the Father turns his face away. He cannot look at his own son on the cross because his own son is carrying sin God's wrath must fall on the Son because of that. The Father cannot have anything to do with that. There is a separation there that actually, we have to say that Jesus is here experiencing hell. Because hell is separation from the Father. Eloi, Eloi, lama sarakthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When our turn comes to die, unless the Lord comes first, our eyes will close, won't they? And we will enter darkness. We no longer see the lights of life. Now for many today, death has become just part of the circle of life, as the Lion King describes it. Uh, something is to accept. Things go round and round in a circle. People die, people are born. That's how it is, just accept it. Do what you can while you're alive, and then kiss goodbye to this worth, and that's it. But the God's word tells us that death is not just part of the circle of life. Death is an imposter. Death is the wages of sin. Jesus, by the way, of course, we know, was without sin. It seems to me that if he'd lived a natural life, he would never have died. He was not under the curse that we're under. We are subject to the curse. He wasn't. He wasn't born under sin. He would have lived forever as a man. But he's entering now the darkness of death because he's carrying our sin, your sin and my sin, on his shoulders. Do we really understand that? I ask that because it's, it's clear that the people who were around him here did not understand it, the onlookers. Just go back for a moment to verse 24. You have the soldiers who crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. So they can't, uh, they can't, they don't care about what's happening on the cross. They're more concerned about the legacy. Who's going to get these nice clothes? Well, clothes, anyway, I don't know what sort of clothes they were exactly, how good they were, but uh, anyway, they think it's worth casting lots to see who would get what. Verse 29, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, oh, you who are going to destroy the temple, come down from the cross and save yourself. They don't understand, do they? The chief priests, they mocked him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. And the robbers, those crucified with him, 
Verse 32. Also, heaped insults on him. They don't understand. Those who have stayed, who are curious to see if Elijah will intervene. They don't understand either, do they? Elijah was a mighty prophet from the Old Testament, as you probably know, uh, who clashed with Ahab and Jezebel, the evil rulers over the northern kingdom of Israel. Elijah was much revered uh, at this time, indeed uh, many times in Israel's history. Uh, partly because at the end of the Old Testament, the second last verse of the Old Testament prophesies his return before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. See, says God, I will send the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. They don't think, oh, it's okay, because uh, until Elijah comes, that great day of the Lord won't come. We're okay until then. We're safe until then. So they're more concerned about Elijah not realising that John the Baptist, of course, was the Elijah who was to come. They missed it. But anyway, they're more concerned about seeing Elijah. And this chap, of course, says, oh, well, let's leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes and take him down. Elijah, our hero. They're far more interested in Elijah than they are in Jesus, aren't they? It's striking how easy it is to become hooked on lesser mortals, lesser heroes, idols. And miss the main thing. Uh, there are those today who pray to Mary, who honour the saints, who beautify churches, perform religious festivals and rites, and yet fail to recognise who Jesus is and what he's done for them. It's very easy, it happens here. You can see all these Jews, religious people, consumed by their own ideas of what's important, and missing the main person dying for them on the cross. So the onlookers, they don't understand. Verse 37 and 38, the curtain. First of all, there is this loud cry. The cry and the curtain are linked. I'll explain. Why is there a loud cry from a man who is dying of asphyxiation, among other things, on the cross? You'll know that one of the things when you're crucified is that you find it very hard to breathe, lift your lungs, uh, to take breath. Now, if you have a sudden uh, jet of pain in you, you may well scream and shout. But actually, crucifixion does not work like that. Crucifixion is to be long and agonizing and slow. It's more likely you would groan or whimper. You don't shout out. You haven't got the breath in you to do it. <coughs> so why is there a loud cry and Jesus breathes his last? Why does he do that? Why does he just groan and just... I, I've, I've, been, I've been present when... Uh, I've been present a couple of deaths um, of, of people and you watch them take their last breath. They don't shout out with a loud cry. They just breathe and then breathe their last and they, and they expire. They may grow, they may whimper, but they go quietly. Why the loud cry? The clue is partly what happens earlier. Uh, this man who offered Jesus a drink. Now, this is not the drink that you find in verse 23. In verse 23, they offered Jesus a, a drink of wine mixed with myrrh. He didn't take it. That was an anaesthetic to try and dull the pain. He wasn't going to have that. It might dull his mind. And, and, and uh, cloud his thinking as he came to the last uh, moments of his life. This is simply uh, a, a drink to refresh him, if you like, to, if you see people uh, near death, their, their lips get all cracked and they actually are desperate for a drink. Uh, and often what you, you do if you're telling someone who's about to die is you have a, a cloth there which you, you put over their lips and uh, keep, it, keep them moist. Jesus, in John's Gospel, Jesus says, I thirst, I thirst. And this is when a man came to him uh, with, this, uh, with this drink of wine vinegar and offered it to him to drink. And it says in John's Gospel, he did drink it. The previous one he refused. This one he doesn't. Because he is summoning all his energy. He is like wetting his lips and giving himself that moisture to enable him to cry out. Because what you're going to hear here is not a cry of death, but a cry of victory. 
And Jesus cries out here, he is not the one that we heard earlier either, Eloi, Eloi, lama samachthani, a cry of despair. This loud cry is a cry of victory. A man who has conquered death because actually he knows that he has paid for sin by his death. He has fulfilled the mission that his father has given him. In John's Gospel, again, we are told what he cried out, the word was, Tetelestai. As he cried out loudly, it was Tetelestai. It is finished. It was a victory cry. It's the word, I remember Steve preaching on this uh, very memorably a, a little while back. It's as if you've got a huge bill, maybe debt, and you're able to pay it off, and you stamp on it, pay in full. Gone with. It is done. What? What bill? It's the bill, the full cost of our redemption from sin. The curse has been lifted. That is why it's an exultant cry, a shout. Yes! It's been achieved. The door to heaven has been opened. The old covenant, which is always temporary, is now obsolete. Now we come to verse 38 and the curtain. This is why it's so important we, we understand this. The curtain was in the temple, the temple was in the city at the far side of Jerusalem. If you know Jerusalem at all, I don't know if you do, but it, it would have been uh, some way away, maybe a mile, maybe even two miles from the cross. You wouldn't be able to see these two things at the same time. If you look at the cross, the, 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 the temple is way behind you. If you're at, you at the temple, you, you wouldn't see the cross. And yet Mark puts these two events together, the loud cry and then the curtain of the temple torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain of the temple, you probably know, is in the inner sanctuary, what separates the most holy place from the rest of the temple. And even the rest of the temple, um, people like us wouldn't be able to go there because we're Gentiles. It, it is a, a series of barriers saying that God is in the middle of this place, but you can't come near. God is in an unapproachable light, remember. You can't come near. The only person who could go in there once a year was the high priest with his sacrifice, with blood. But only him, no one else. It was if you like uh, a big keep out sign. Don't come near. The curtain separated all ordinary mortals from the most holy place. Only the high priest. And only once a year. But now we read this in the New Testament. We can have confidence to enter the most holy place. Now it isn't actually the temple. It's the temple itself was a model actually of heaven. And the most holy place is where God lives. And what we're told is that when this temple is ripped in, the curtain is ripped in two, it's not into a physical building we can go. The keep out sign has been thrown away. We can enter heaven itself. This is how the writer of the Hebrews continues. We can have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain. That is his body. Do you see? The body on the cross, the loud cries, Jesus dies, and the curtain, actually they're the same. The curtain, we're told, represents his body. The curtain is ripped in two. The body on that cross is mangled and broken, devoid of life. The curtain is useless. This body on the cross is just a corpse. But the keep out sign has been removed and we can enter the most holy place, heaven itself, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And then finally we have the Gentile, verse 39. A Roman centurion, part indeed of the execution squad, in fact probably the commander of the execution squad. He is standing there in front of Jesus. And he hears the cry and sees how he died and says, Surely this man was the Son of God. We began, uh, I began by reading the first words of the Bible darkness over the face of the deep. 
the first words of Mark's Gospel. Chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark declares in the first verse of his Gospel who Jesus is, the Son of God. After that, no one recognises that. No one uses that term until now. That's why quite a few commentators reckon that this is the, the apex of the whole gospel. When a centurion says, surely this man was the Son of God. At last, one person, 15 chapters on, three years on, one person has said, yes, he is who the Bible declares him to be at the very beginning. He is the Son of God. At last, one person has recognised what Mark has said is the truth about Jesus, the Son of God. God, this is the climax of the whole gospel. Do you, do you see that? Something has been revealed to this man that all the others standing round have failed to see. The soldiers, the onlookers, the passers-by, the chief priests, those who weren't there, those who fled. And I want you to notice particularly where the centurion is standing. The centurion who stood there in front of Jesus. I looked at the ESV um, when I was doing this, uh, the English Standard Version, and it says this. Uh, it means the same, but it's quite a bit more, uh, a bit more stark. It, it says they who stood facing him, facing him. The centurion is looking at the face of Jesus. In fact, of all the people, he is probably the nearest to Jesus. And he's looking at him full in the face. Do you remember the others? Do you remember Peter, who followed at a distance? And has now scarred anyway. Do you remember the women, also? Uh, back in verse 44, isn't it? Or up forward in, in, in verse, uh, verse 40. Uh, some women were watching from a distance. We've seen how that distance is not just physical, it's also spiritual as well. They are apart from him. But this centurion is looking full in the face. He's in front of him and looking directly at him. And he is the one who sees that this is indeed the Son of God. This is a great signpost of what's going to happen to this gospel of the rest of the New Testament. It's the outsiders. It's the unexpected ones who are going to come to faith. Not those who are familiar with the story and for whom it's actually very humdrum. So, Scripture, all Scripture has now been fulfilled. Say all of it, certainly all that pointed to Christ's <coughs> fulfilment of this mission and of his, uh, uh, his dealing with sin and opening the, the life gates, as one hymn puts it, that all may go in. God's great plan of salvation has been completed, Jesus has stooped to the lowest point possible. Remember in Philippians it says that he humbled himself, he became a man and lived among us. That was humbling enough for eternal God. But he became obedient to death as well. Even death on a cross. He, he could live forever. But he became obedient to death and even the most humiliating, agonizing death conceivable. Death on a cross. Now, I expect we know all this already. Um, even those two lads who came Sunday evening a, a couple weeks ago, e e even they knew that Jesus died and been crucified on the cross. But have we understood? Have we really understood? See, this centurion is the punchline of the gospel, isn't it? This is what, this is the, this, if you're reading this gospel as a Jew at the time, you, you, you'd be shocked. You stand a centurion. Why is it he that sees this and not the not the Jews all around. Paul, who was a Jew, wrote about this in Romans. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah, again another prophet, says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, says Paul, did they not hear? Have you not heard? Have people like they're not heard? Of course they did, he says. Their voice, that is the voice of the prophets and the voice of the gospel, it has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. 
We do this study on a Friday. We go out and we, we, people know about it, but they actually haven't actually listened to it very carefully at all or understood it. And they still don't. Again, I ask, says Paul, did Israel not understand? Did they not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. This centurion was someone who was uh, from a completely unreligious background. He was a soldier uh, and a Gentile. And Isaiah says boldly, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. This is him, isn't it? But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. The people around the cross, the soldiers, more particularly the onlookers, the passers-by, the chief priests, the bystanders, they're, they're watching this and they don't see it or understand it. As we sit here this morning, we are in one sense gathered around the cross, aren't we? We're listening to the death of Jesus Christ. Who are we most like in this story? Who do you identify with most of all? Familiarity with the scriptures, familiarity with the Bible, with Christianity, with church, is not going to save us. But standing in front of the cross, looking full in the face of Christ, and having him revealed as the Son of God, will save us. So three things I want us to go away with, and in our minds, to be sure we understand. First of all, do you understand, have we understood, have I understood, the importance of the day of the Lord? Judgment day. In the Old Testament, the day of the Lord was the climax of history. They thought that the whole history would come to an end. One day when, when Elijah would come first, and after that it would be the day of judgment. And the Jews would be, if they were good Jews, they'd be in heaven, and everyone else would be in the other place. But in his mercy... God has caused that day of the law to be even like stretched out. Here it is dawning. The day of the Lord has begun here. And as it dawns, God is saying, here is an escape route by which you can become sons of light, by which you can escape the day of the Lord when it comes. Don't, don't long for it if you're not part of the light because it will blind you, it will destroy you. One day it will arrive in its fullness and then it's too late. But here God is saying, he's pleading with us, look, here is an opportunity for you to put your trust in this light before that full day comes and the light becomes unbearable. Do you realise the importance of this, the day of the Lord? The judgment that will come one day, do your hearts flinch at the thought of it? Do your knees knock? Do the hairs on the back of your neck stand up on end and think, wow, well, that day comes, what it? Where am I in relation to that now? Have you understood, have we understood the importance of the curtain? This is the end of the Old Covenant. It doesn't mean to say we ignore the Old Testament, not at all. But it's the end of the way that which you could approach God through the temple and through the sacrifices. Now, none of us here, I think, are a Jew, so we weren't included in the Old Covenant anyway, were we? It was no help to us. But, you know, people today still try to recreate it. How do they do that? Well, we have priesthood. And we call people priests, people who are intermediaries between us and God. Uh, we build whole buildings and call them holy. I think that in some way those buildings are more holy than other buildings. We consecrate them. We devise rituals and methods by which we can approach God. We erect barriers to come close to him. There are no barriers. What we do in effect, we create distance, don't we? We're like the women and Peter. We're at a distance. And we put distance between ourselves and God with these barriers. We recreate the Old Testament. I say we, people generally. You can go to quite a few churches and you will find there are certain things, certain barriers that will be there for you to approach God. But we are told that actually that curtain is his body and it's been torn that we can enter in and have free access to the very throne of God, a new and living way by which we can actually come close to God. He has destroyed the barrier 
the dividing wall of hostility that did exist, but exists no longer. The temple curtain has been ripped in two from top to bottom. God has done it. Do we understand that? That we can enter in freely, no matter who we are, no matter how bad we are, no matter what our catalogue of sin in our lives. And then finally, do we understand the importance of what the Bible calls, what we call, substitution. That is, on that cross, he was dying in our place, on our behalf, on my behalf, on your behalf. Jesus is dealing with my sin and your sin on that cross. And in that case, if that is the case, something in us, something in me must change if I have faith in him. I can't look at him from the face and then walk away with my sin still. If he's dealt with it, something has happened to my sin, it's been dealt with, it's been taken away on that cross. I guess everyone here has been baptised. Maybe as a baby. Maybe you were Christian as a baby, maybe as an adult. <coughs> Did you know that when you were baptised, in theory at any rate, you were saying, I have died with Christ on the cross? Baptism is a form of, it's a symbol of death. It's saying that his death on the cross has taken the place of my death. I am symbolising my death, my baptism, but actually, he's died for me. But something in me has changed because of that. I am not the same person when I come out of the baptism as when I went in, under the water. Paul puts it like that, like this. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So can I ask you, is your old self crucified on the cross with him? He came to pay the debt for our sin. He came to pay for it in full. Tetelestai. Is your, is your sin now dealt with on that cross? Or are you still carrying it with you? Because if that is the case, then you haven't yet, like that centurion, looked at him full in the face, recognised who he is, had revealed to you from God himself that this is the Son of God. And maybe there's a distance, like the women, like the disciples. Now is the time, perhaps, to stand there as we come to communion in a few <coughs> minutes to recognise in that bread and wine that we are looking at the crucified Saviour on the cross. Let's just close our eyes for a few moments and then we'll come to the stage before we come to the bread and wine.